Amen. Come on. You guys ready to get into Journey Through John? Journey Through John. You guys been enjoying the series so far? Amen. If you're new here, we want to say welcome, welcome, welcome. Special welcome to you for joining us for the very first time. If we could give it up for our first time guests, that would be awesome. Amen. Let them know that we love them and appreciate them coming. If you're online, I know you've probably been made to feel welcome already, but we want to say welcome again uh, for you who are online. Last week, who remembers what we talked about last week? Anybody? At least give me the title of last week's message. And I hear some notes flipping. Jesus the, give me a hint. Life giver. Yes, Jesus the life giver. We talked about Jesus being the one who brings life, right? We know that the Bible tells us a lot about God being the life giver, the devil being the life snuffer outer, right? Because he says, behold, I have come to give you life. Life more abundantly is what God said. He says, but the thief, though, comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy, right? And so we talked a little bit about Jesus. Uh, We looked at the fact that he had raised Lazarus, his friend, from the dead. Very familiar story, right? And uh, we kind of analyzed some things that were going on at the time, and we looked at the significance of that miracle. Um, You can go back and watch it uh, here on our on our Facebook page, you can watch it again or on, on our YouTube channel. But just brief, briefly, uh, we talked about the fact that the resurrection of Lazarus was the most significant of the earthly miracles Jesus had performed. And the reason for that is because not that Jesus had r- not raised somebody from the dead before, but this was the first time he waited four days after they had died to raise someone from the dead. And that was significant to the Jewish leaders who were opposing him because now it was a bona fide miracle. Because you were not really dead until after four days because some people were prematurely put in tombs and stuff like that. And they would resurrect because they weren't dead in the first place. But after your body starts to rot and decay and stink, now you're officially dead. And so Jesus performed a bona fide miracle to them, solidifying his place as God. Amen? So we covered all of that last time, and today, just by way of a little bit of a setup, um, we are looking at a gathering that's now happening, because Jesus had people who had come to the house. They were gathered together because they wanted to comfort Martha and Mary, Lazarus's sisters. So they were all there, and they were in town for a convention, kind of like Vegas, right? They were in town because they had the big festival going on, and Jesus particularly chose these times to do great things because he knows and he knew that there would be a large audience of people that were there that would need what he had. Amen? And so this was the time when they were gathered together, and Jesus' focus was on the spectators and building their faith. Right In modern times, it would be like Jesus waiting for EDC or something to come to Vegas. Or uh, what, what do you call that, 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 uh, that one um, with the cartoon characters that, that happens here in Vegas? Comic-Con? Yeah, like waiting for Comic-Con. And then Jesus appears on Vegas Boulevard and starts preaching and performing miracles. So it was kind of like that. At this time, because a lot of sojourners and travelers were coming in, and, uh, and he used this opportunity to perform this great miracle in the front of these crowds. But the purpose was to build their faith. How many of you know Jesus will often do things to get our attention so he can build our faith? If he doesn't get our attention, then he can't show us who he is. He can't begin to direct us to where he wants us to go. So Quite often, and some of you may attest to this, that early on in your relationship with the Lord, something significant happened so that God could grab your attention. And then from that point, you started following him, right? And we talked about this last week where, and then after that, you're like, well, the miracles dried up. What happened? How come I'm not seeing a miracle every week? Because God's purpose was fulfilled. He got your attention and we don't have to get a miracle every week single week. But Lazarus was raised to death in the presence of these people to prove who Jesus was. And also we're going to look at this as well. Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead physically is also an indicator or 
a sign of what Jesus does for us spiritually. Right? We're going to take a look at that real quick. Jesus' resurrection of Lazarus spiritually, uh, physically is the same as what he does for us physically. Let's look at Ephesians 2, chapters one, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Still in the NLT, y'all. Still in the NLT. And it reads, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. How many of you had many sins? Not just one or two. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask how many of you still have them, but we, we, we won't do that to you. Verse 2, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is in the spirit at work in the hearts of of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very own nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. Verse 4, but God is so rich in mercy. Somebody say, God is rich in mercy. And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So a lot in there, right, about us being dead to sin, being resurrected in Christ. And I want to give you four ways that Lazarus's resurrection is like our spiritual resurrection. Four ways that we are like Lazarus. Let's look at number one. Number one, numero uno. Lazarus was dead, right? Completely dead. And we, who were sinners, were dead in our sins. Right? This scripture here tells us that already. Lazarus was dead, and we who are sinners were dead in our sins. Number two, Lazarus was decayed. He was therefore what, four days, body rotting, and he was beginning to stink, beginning to smell. Well, guess what? That was some of us, right? That might be some of you right now. What does that mean? We were in sin a long time. For some people, only by God's grace. We didn't die in the state that we were in. God gave us enough patience, long-suffering, following up with us, Giving us chance after chance, right? So many of us were decaying in the condition we were in, just like Lazarus was. Number three, Lazarus was raised by the power of God, and sinners are spiritually raised to life by the power of God. It's all God's power at work in us, right? God has the power not just to raise the physical body, but he has the power to raise our spiritual selves, as well, to take us up out of that mess. How many can say amen to that? Amen. How many of you have experienced that yourself? Amen. 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 You look in the mirror and you don't recognize yourself anymore, right? How many of you have family members that don't know what to do with you? Because they tried to put a label on you, but it doesn't fit anymore. So now they're confused. Because it doesn't stick. It doesn't work, right? Mm-hmm. Let's look at John 5.24. John 5, 24, he says, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed, what? From death to life. That's those of us now who have had that spiritual resurrection by the power of God. And then finally, number four, Lazarus was not only raised to life by Jesus, he was later sitting and having a meal with Jesus, right? If you look at John 12, which is the following uh, chapter after the one we're in, verses 1 and 2, it records that six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Can I tell you something? That, again, is a snapshot of what we will experience with Jesus. Because how many of you know there is something called the marriage sup of the Lamb? 
Which is when we get to heaven, we're going to sit down and have a glorious meal with Jesus after not only have we been spiritually resurrected, but after our bodily resurrection as well. Praise God. Amen. Amen. And we're going to take a look at Colossians 3, 1 through 4, just so you can get the biblical uh, vision of this. It says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, there's that resurrection language again. He says, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. So Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. The Bible says making intercession for you and me, right? He's taken up his position as high priest. And we're going to get into that a little bit later in this message. But it says we will be seated with him in heavenly places. So just like Lazarus was later on having a meal with Jesus, we too, after our resurrection... We're going to be having a meal with Jesus. Amen. Amen. So today, we're going to proceed forward. I've titled this message, Jesus, the seed of God's family. Jesus, the seed of God's family. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this word, this time, these people. Thank you, God, that you have a specific word in mind for your people today, and I pray that it is executed with precision. Lord God, use me for your honor and your glory that I might deliver this word according to your purpose, plan, and your will. And I thank you, Lord God, that hearts are open and receptive. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody shout it together. Amen. Amen. All right, so now let's get into today's text. We're in chapter 11. We're going to pick up in verse 45. And my goal is to make it to the end of this chapter by the end of this message. So let's start with uh, verses 45 and 46. It says, Many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen. So what? If we back up to where we left off last time, Jesus had just walked into the tomb of Lazarus, shouted, Lazarus, come out of there! And Lazarus came out Grave clothes and all gone, and he was back to life again, right? So when the people saw this, it said many believed in Jesus. Verse 46, but some went to the Pharisees, snitches, and told them what Jesus had done. So you got the people who were all for Jesus, rooting for him. Yeah, this is awesome. This is cool. We just witnessed our Savior raise somebody from the dead. And then you had those like, I'm going to tell on you. Because they understood that Jesus was a man who was doing some controversial things. And of course, the crowd consisted of those who were opposed to him. So they wanted to run back now and alert the high council. Now, here's the deal. Many is not all. Many is not all, right? It said many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus. And it's unfortunate that it's not all people. Because you would think that Jesus making himself known and revealing who he is would capture the hearts of all people. But unfortunately, that is not the case. Again, we see this as a repeated theme. I don't know if you've noticed from week to week in this series. Because Jesus is constantly in the front of different crowds of people, and we see the same exact thing happening. We see those who would oppose him and those who would follow him, right? But these people are the picture of our church today. And and when I say our church, I don't just mean our public, local gathering. I'm talking about also the global church of Jesus, where you have people who would sit under the sound of sermons, messages, and talks like this, many would believe, but some would not. And this is what was happening right now. The Pharisees themselves were behind much of this action, 
And we're going to see a little bit more about what they did here. Let's look at verse number 47. Let's read 47 and 48. It says, Then the leading priests and Pharisees called the high council together. What are we going to do? They asked each other. This man certainly performs many miraculous signs. If we allow him to go on like this, soon everyone will believe in him. Then the Roman army will come and destroy both the temple, our temple, and our nation. So the Pharisees had alerted what's called the high council, right? The high council. Who was the high council? This was the Sanhedrin committee that consisted of former high priests and the families of those who were high priests. And they carried a lot of weight. They carried a lot of power. And the Pharisees themselves didn't have the authority to do anything about Jesus, though they wanted to. So what they do? They call for backup. They went to the people that they knew had the power, right? The council, calling them together. And the Sanhedrin was the highest judicial body in Israel at the time. Check this out. They executed judicial, legislative, and executive powers throughout the land. So this was the people to go to if you wanted something done with Jesus. Especially the fact that they had opposed Jesus. So the Pharisees knew exactly who to go to. And why? Because they wanted to get rid of Jesus. Now, here's something that you may or may not know. The exact same thing is happening today in this nation. You have those powers that be that are running legislative law, governmental law, that are anti-Christ, anti-Christian. And you have people groups that are opposing And I may get in trouble for this, but I don't care. Like Black Lives Matter, that are opposing traditional Christianity. They're in bed with the government to oppose the church. Right? And unfortunately, a lot of pastors are drinking the Kool-Aid. Because they don't have spiritual discernment to tell the difference. And I don't know if you've heard, but there's something called woke culture. And I have dedicated some time. I know this is going to be like the third or fourth series I promised you. But I promise this one's coming too. But I'm going to teach you. I'm going to do a series called uh, Christian Theology versus Critical Thinking or Critical Theory. Because we need to understand what is happening right now in our world. And how serious this is. And let me just give you a little bit of snapshot. You ready? You know that everything that God does, the devil tries to imitate, right? The devil tries to take it, but he twists it, right? So he can't really do what God does, so so he comes up with his own version of it. Well, the revelation of the Spirit of God and the illumination of the Word of God, the devil counterfeits that too. And that's what he calls woke. That's really just copying from God because we are awakened from our sin and we are enlightened by God. So the devil has his false version of that. And we're going to get into more of that later. But I just want to say, just as these Pharisees went to the the council, the Sanhedrin council, who were already opposing Christ to try to get them on board to get rid of Jesus, same thing's happening in our world today. And make no mistake about it, there are those who are in legislative government and who are in high-ranking positions who are opposing the Christian values that you and I hold today. They can shut me down. I don't care. We're going to have underground church if we have to. And I know I'm on Facebook Live, and I know some of my family and friends are going to say, why would you do that? It's because I have to say what God gives me to say. And I'm sorry, but nobody pays me to say what I'm going to say. Nobody's Nobody's in my pocket like a little puppet stringing me along. No, I work for God only. And at this very moment, those things are happening. And I'll give you just a little bit of an example. I don't want to go too deep into the weeds on this, but I just want to show you what I'm talking about, right? There's a lot of changing of Christians' rights right now. So a lot of what you and I believe, if we say that, it's now deemed hate speech. Why? Because we're not inclusive. We're not inclusive. And let me just tell you, you don't have to be. Don't bend 
to the pressure that the world is giving you and the culture is giving you to conform. Because we don't have to be inclusive. God is not inclusive. Now, he loves everybody, but not everybody loves him. Right? But there is a distinction between those who belong to Christ and those who do not. All right? So they are trying to change the Christian's rights to convey their own belief as hate speech because we don't acknowledge sin as acceptable, nor the behavior of sinners and their lifestyle as appropriate in God's eyes. So because we're not agreeing with them, then there's this other thing that's come up, right? Cancel culture. Cancel culture means you don't agree with me, we're going to cancel you. And did you know that back in the day, you, you had a platform where two different sides could argue their, their positions and they could agree to disagree? That's not the case anymore. It's now you agree with me or we're getting rid of you. But then they have the audacity to call us intolerant. <laughs> Funny how that works. They're also changing the curriculum in your children's schools. You got to be aware of this. So if you're thinking about public, uh, private school or home school, now would be a good time. They're teaching your children the things that are anti what you are teaching them at home. Yeah, those, those Christian values, they're not getting those at school. And they're contrary. An example of that was teaching your is teaching your children to be non-binary. I don't know if you know that term. I'm going to talk more about that in the series. But just to, to let you know, bi means two. Okay? Binary means two opposing sides, two opposites. So what they're teaching your children is there's no more male, there's no more female, what we call cisgender. They're trying to get rid of that. And what they're saying is, oh, if you want to be a boy today and you're born a girl, then you can, you can be what you want to be and you can use whatever bathroom that goes along with the way you feel today. Those are the kinds of things they're teaching your children. I don't know if you knew that. And they're making it a part of the curriculum and they have now this to teachers unions that have more power than they ever had before who have the right to do it. And guess what else? They're telling the kids that you don't have to tell your parents these things. Yeah. Even though they're minors. This is what's happening. We need to know what's happening in our world today, church. And as your pastor, it's my job to tell you if you didn't know. Now, the problem with this belief is God, in his viewpoint and in his creation, is very binary. Bless you. Now, let me qualify this. Because some people use this in the opposite way that it's meant to be used. God's not binary, meaning he's both male and female at the same time. Because some people use that term. Because throughout the Bible, God is referred to as he. Even though he's not a person, the Bible says he is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So God is a spirit, but he's always referred to as father. He's referred to in the male sense, right? Okay. But here is how God's ideas are all binary. Because there's God, there's Satan. There's good, there's evil. There's heaven, there's hell, right? Makes sense? There's right, there's wrong. There's sinners, there's saints. But this new woke culture will tell you to be non-binary and they're mixing the whole thing up. So it's like, well, let's just get rid of gender. Let's get rid of anything that is going to look like dividing sides and opposing. Let's just all be in one pool together. So... In other words, no one's going to heaven and no one's going to hell. Everyone's going to a better place. You see how deceptive and dangerous this belief system really is, right? This is what's happening today. So this anti-Christian, pharisaical spirit of the age started around the 60s. I don't know if you know this. And they've been building on it and building on it. 
And with all of the things that has happened, especially with things like the George Floyd situation, they just rode right in on that chariot to try to put their flag in the ground. And what they're doing is they're deceiving people who are well-intentioned people, and they're using certain phraseology and certain words that make it sound like equality and to make people think, oh, well, they must be doing the right thing. But I know I mentioned Black Lives Matter, and if you, don't, if you have a problem with that, go to their website. They tell you themselves who they are. Yeah. They tell you that they're Marxist. They tell you that they're anti-cisgender, so they're, a, they're anti-God's idea of family. They're anti-God's idea of everything. And now they're trying to put it in government, put it in schools. put it. It's been in colleges. You know why it's been in colleges? Because colleges are the preparation for tomorrow's generation. So if they can infiltrate the next set of influencers, the next set of lawyers and doctors, then that's the place to do it. Even though many of these colleges like Yale University and others were started as Christian colleges. Okay, so back to our story. <laughs> Same situation, different era. Because the devil is a one-trick pony. He's not creative like God. He, kept, he keeps doing the same stupid thing over and over again. Just with a different generation, in a different context, and in a different way. But this is what he was doing here. Same exact thing. And now they're also making this, the, the Christians stand against violence. Do you know that even now, and you may have heard some of the stories in, in, in the news and stuff like that. But they're even changing legislative law to make it illegal to stand on your Christian rights. So you have businesses that are run by good Christian people that have Christian convictions and values who say, I refuse to do business that way because it violates my Christian or my religious belief, but now you can go to jail or you can lose your business. A, a, a case, an example that you may have heard of was the couple that owned the bakery. Right? So you had the LGBTQ couple that walks in and wants a cake, and they said, I'm sorry, we reserve the right to refuse business because we don't believe in homosexual marriage. Oh, well, now they're all over them trying to get them to go to jail. This is the reality of what we need to be aware of and what we need to be prepared for, church. And when preachers like me talk about stuff like this, let me just tell you, we're not looking for a fight. We're not picking a fight. The fight's already engaged. The war's already been started. And we're just defending the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we will die doing it if we have to. Yeah, Christian theology versus critical theory. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it. I know you guys voted for me to do the book of Revelation next. But I think this one is more priority. Because the book of Revelation is what com what's coming this stuff is happening now. So I think we're going to make that one priority if you guys are okay with that. Okay, verse 49. It says, Caiaphas, who was the high priest at the time, said, You don't know what you're talking about. You don't realize that it's better for you that one man should die for the people than for the whole nation to be destroyed. He did not say this on his own. As high priest at the time, he was led to prophesy that Jesus would die for the entire nation. Verse 52, and not only for that nation, but to bring together and unite all the children of God scattered around the world. Now, Caiaphas was high priest. He was appointed in A.D. 18, right? Shortly after his father-in-law had occupied the same position. Later on, Caiaphas would be kicked out by the Roman government out of his position. But before that... He would be responsible and he would be one of those people that would have a lot to do with what was coming against Jesus at the time. All right? And so the words that he said here was using the language of God without realizing that he was using the language of God. All right? Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Let's go back and uh, read again. It says, this is what he says, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't realize it's better for you that one man should die for the people than for the whole nation to be destroyed. Why he said that was he was looking out for his own office, 
trying to protect his position. And he was trying to protect the nation from, from Roman upheaval. But what he didn't realize was God was curating his words and he was actually prophesying that Jesus would be our penal substitutionary atonement. Penal substitutionary atonement. What does that mean? Penal comes from the word penalty, right? Jesus is the one who paid the penalty for our sins. The Bible says that the, what? Wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life. So the penalty for sin is death. Jesus paid that. So the penal. Substitutionary means that Jesus was our substitute. He stood in our place, receiving upon himself what we should have received, right? And atonement meaning to atone for or to satisfy. So we needed to, or someone needed to satisfy the wrath of God against sin. Because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there can be no removal or remission of sins. So Jesus' blood had to now be the, the blood that take, take, took away sins because the blood of bulls and goats, the Bible teaches us, never took away sins. It was just temporary in place until Jesus showed up on the scene. Make sense? So what this guy Caiaphas was doing was actually prophesying on behalf of God without even realizing what he was doing. Which is pretty interesting. And when it says prophecy, it really means to proclaim a truth. Let me just uh, break this down for you real quick. Because we hear the word prophecy in church world a lot, right? Prophecy means two things, not one. Two things. Sometimes prophecy means to foretell the, the future. But sometimes prophecy means to proclaim a truth. So you can prophesy by proclaiming God's truth, or you can prophesy of something in the future that has not yet happened. Make sense? So what he was doing was both of those things. He was proclaiming a truth, but he was also, without realizing it, pointing to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection that had not happened yet. Isn't that cool how God does that? Huh. And here's the reason why God used him as a prophet. Because in his position as high priest, if you go back to the beginning of how this whole thing was started, one of the jobs of the high priest, get ready for this, is to reveal who God really is to the people. Well, if I remember correctly, the Bible teaches us that Jesus is now our great high priest. Didn't Jesus come to reveal to us who God is? He was God in the flesh who came to reveal God to mankind. Isn't that powerful? And then there's the uniting together that he's talking about here. He says, at this time, he was led to prophesy these things. Not only that, but to bring the nations together, the children of God that were scattered, right? To bring them all together. Can I tell you this, church? God is a uniter, right? He is the one who unites and brings people together. And, be, and, and there's two different ways that this reference was made when it comes to uniting. Two reasons for that. Number one, the Jews were dispersed. And they were gathered back again. They would be reunited again into the promised land. Also, if you fast forward in history, in 1948... There is a word called the diaspora, which is the dispersed Jews. They came back together again and made Israel a nation in 1948. So in, in a sense, he was prophesying that. But also there's another way he is prophesying this uniting of God's people. Because the Bible talks about the Jews and the Gentiles now being together as one family. Because now it's based on faith. Faith is what unites us in God's family, not whether we are Jew or a Gentile, right? Because the Bible says there's neither Jew nor Greek, no Gentile, none of that stuff. There's not black, not white, male nor female. In other words, un under Christ, if you're born of faith, you're a part of the family. It has nothing to do with your heritage, your lineage, your nationality, your upbringing, none of that stuff. It's based on your faith in Jesus. So the family that Jesus died to raise up is us, you and I. And he is that seed that was planted in order for God to reap a harvest. 
And here's what Jesus said when he was predicting his own death. John 12, 23 and 24. It says, and Jesus said, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, and some translations will say a seed goes into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of what? New lives. So Jesus was the, the kernel or the seed that went into the ground to die, to do what? To produce many, a plentiful harvest of new lives. That's you and I who are born into God's family now that we've accepted Christ. So here we see that God creates, right? He creates a family because he is creator. Satan does the exact opposite. He tries to dismantle everything that God creates. And we talked about the family, the nucleus of the family, right? Which is male and female. But Satan wants to counterfeit that. He wants to destroy that. God united his family because he is that uniter. Satan causes division. You may have seen this in your families, in some of your families. Where there is godliness in your families, you will always see God at work trying to unify and reconcile relationships. Whether it's husband and wife who've been going through issues and problems or of an estranged parent or whatever the situation is, God's always at work trying to unify and reconcile people and families and relationships while the enemy always comes in to create division and divisiveness arguments and situations that where people become intolerant and angry and they feud and they stop speaking to one another and all of this nonsense and so you can see the two differences at work there God uses adoption to welcome us into his family while Satan uses abduction to seduce people away from God's family. So God adopts us. Satan tries to abduct us. One's legal. One's not. Don't ever expect him to play fair. Because Satan always plays dirty. He always goes the illegal route. Here's what we mean. But let's look at Romans 8.15. Talking about our adoption it says so you have received or not rather so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves instead you received God's spirit when he what adopted you as his own children now we can call him dad we now have the right to call God dad but see we were out there no family, no spiritual family to speak of. We weren't a part of God's family for sure. But when we accepted Jesus, the Holy Spirit baptized us into God's family. Somebody stopped me the other day and was asking me about baptism. They said they were greatly concerned about their son. They had found out about our church and somehow they got our, our, our contact information and they contacted uh, me. And I had this conversation and this woman was distraught. She said, I had a 19-year-old son. And she began to tell me about her son, and he had lost his life recently. And she didn't know if he was saved because she said he was scheduled to be water baptized, and he missed the date. And the day before he was supposed to be baptized, he died. I said, can I tell you some wonderful news? I said, based on everything you just explained to me, how his life began to change and how the Lord began to work in his life, it sounds like he died in Christ. I said, do you know that water baptism does not save anyone? We're water baptized because it's an outward expression to the world of what Jesus has done inside of us. But water doesn't save anyone. It's the Spirit of God. And the real baptism is when Jesus, when we accept him, and the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the family of God. That's the true baptism right there. So we are adopted, not abducted. And after all, in Revelation 12, verse 10, I don't have that on screen for you, but just by way of information, 
Revelation 12.10 says, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. In other words, he is the one day and night who is always accusing God's people of something before God. That doesn't sound like a loving father to me. That sounds more like the abductor, not the adopter. Verse 53. And we're going to take it to the end. 57. It says, from that time on, the Jewish leaders began to plot Jesus' death. As a result, Jesus stopped his public ministry among, with people, among the people that left Jerusalem. He went to a place near the wilderness to the village of Ephraim and stayed there with his disciples. It was now almost time for the Jewish Passover celebration. And many people from all over the country had arrived in Jerusalem several days early so they could go through the purification ceremony before Passover again. Again, this is where we're seeing that people were coming to gather together in Jerusalem because of the Passover festival. It says, they kept looking for Jesus, but as they stood around in the temple, they said to each other, what do you think? He won't come for Passover, will he? Meanwhile, the leading priests and Pharisees had publicly ordered that anyone seeing Jesus must report immediately so that they could arrest him. So he was a wanted man at this point. And he escaped to find solitude. And where he went to was about 20 miles away so that he and his disciples could take a moment. How many of you have ever just needed a moment? I think some of us don't uh, have underestimated the power of taking a moment. Sometimes you just need to step back, come out of the middle of all of it, find some solitude, just you and God. Find rest. Find recuperation. Find resuscitation. Amen. Find recalibration and all the other Asians. But just you and Jesus. For some of you, you got to shut down technology. Shut off the gram, fam. Right? Whatever it is you have to do to take a minute. Because if Jesus was God and he needed one, I think we need one too. But sometimes we're so busy with the noise, the noise, the noise, that we can't hear his voice. And especially if you're going through a crisis or a hard time or a tough situation, those are times you need the most to be tuned into what the Spirit of God is saying to you. So Jesus had traveled about 20 miles away to a place called Ephraim where he and his disciples were finding a little bit of solace. And of course, many were wondering where he was, trying to find him. But the stage was now being set, wasn't it? Because he would die soon. Coming up shortly, we're going to see where Jesus would be executed, murdered for something he didn't do. But in all of this, we get to see man at his worst. But we also get to see Jesus, or God rather, at his best. And everything that transpired in Jesus' life up to that moment, can I tell you this, was calculated by God. Every single thing. Good, bad, indifferent. God being sovereign knows how to use bad situations for his benefit and for his glory. And for your benefit. And nothing takes place that God is surprised by. Nothing takes place that God is still not in control of. And even though wicked and evil things happen in this broken, fallen, sinful world, God's still the one who is very much in control. Many people think that he's not. And there's a term they use for that. Absentee landlord is what they call him. Because they said he's supposed to be governing all of this stuff. And what is he doing? Is he on vacation? Why is he not paying attention to all these hurtful things that are going on in the world? He is. He's patient. He's watching. And he will judge this world one day. And those who have done evil, those who have done wrong, those who did not receive him, have their just reward coming. Just as those who have believed him and trusted him have their reward coming. Well, one's not really a reward. It's more of a punishment. But God sees and knows all things. 
Yes, God still moved with compassion. God is still love. God still hurts when we hurt. All of those things do move God. But we also know that God knows exactly what he's doing. And this is where faith and trust come in. And we have to believe that as bad as it looks out here, there is still a God that governs the whole thing. He's still in his office. He's still on his throne. He's still ruling and reigning. And what we're going to see happen is this. This is, this is the dichotomy, right? This is the dichotomy, the, the bad and the good happening at the same time. The worse the world gets, the more people are going to come to Christ. Why? Because the world's getting worse. And people are looking for an out. And people are looking for answers. And people who have been running from God for a long time, we are already now seeing them running back to God. Because they're like, you know what, this ain't working. Or some of them are just afraid. They're like, I tried that lifestyle. I thought it was fun. But now this is just weird. Because this is a different place now. This world is completely different. And I don't know what to make of it. And I believe that there is an anxiety that God has put in some hearts to get some people uncomfortable enough to get out of their situations so that they do lean on him, draw on him, call on him, respond to him. Amen. So we're going to see a lot of things happen, church, just as, I guess, if you want to call it a prophecy, you can call it one. It's not really a prophecy because the book of Revelation and other books of the Bible that are prophetic books already told us what to expect. It talks about siblings hating one another in the last days. It talks about people turning from the faith in the last days. It talks about people becoming more blasphemous than they've ever been. Yeah, Netflix. I shared with you guys recently that we had to get rid of Netflix. And it ain't just Netflix. There's other platforms too where you could barely watch a show. There's one show my wife and I tried to watch, and literally within the 10 minutes, there were at least 10 different ways they blasphemed God in the first 10 minutes of that show. And we can't just be eating that stuff up if we're Christians. I don't care how entertaining it is or how cool the videography is and the cinematography and how suave you think the, the, the lead actor is. We cannot feed our spirits that garbage and be comfortable with it. Times are getting serious. Times are getting tough. That's why we have to preach this gospel like we've never preached it before. And let me just tell you, some people will be offended by what we say. But that's just a part of the process. Our job is not to, not, our job is not to make everybody feel good. Our job is to speak the truth in love. And unfortunately, some people won't see the love aspect of it. They will only see the offense aspect of it, which is unfortunate because we do love all people and we do want these messages to be loving revelations from God. But that is not reality. So in the coming months and years, should the Lord tarry, don't be surprised if some people walk away from this church or from your lives because of your speaking truth in love to them. Understand that it is a part of the process. Not all, like we've read, believed in Jesus. Though they were all a part of the same crowd, not everyone was hearing the same thing. Though they were in the same gathering, not everyone responded the same way. And that is con going to continue to happen. Amen? Amen? All right. Well, I'm going to end there. I know it's not a happy, clappy moment. <laughs> but this was more of a reality check situation. I know we, we, we try to be a little comical in the pulpit, and I try to give you a lot of jokes and stuff from time to time. But there are moments, though, we have to just be serious about the current condition our, our, our nation's in and the current situation Christianity's in. Because I don't know if you've felt it, but we are under heavy attack. And some of us are still living in a little bit of a bubble because we don't really have that 
show up on our front porch yet. But I'm forewarning you because it is coming. Because eventually we're going to have to come face to face with these things. You know why? Because the devil doesn't play fair. And he continues to encroach on your belief system until he is in your face. And you have no choice but to say something or do something. So we're all going to experience some of it. And like I told you guys weeks ago, they're going to start trying to mute churches more. They're going to try to shut us up. They don't want us to say the things we say. But that's all right. Because either we're going to offend people or we're going to offend God for not saying what he said. And I'm not about to offend God. So we lose some along the way then so be it. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much again for your word. And though strong at times, we know, Lord, that it comes from a place of love. We know, Lord, that your Bible declares that your will is that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. But we know, Lord, that many do walk away. And so we just pray, God, that for those that will belong to you, those that will say yes, even though they're not saying it right now, we pray that you would continue to work in their hearts, continue to pull them, draw them, and strengthen them. Let them know. Reveal to them, Lord, that you are speaking to them. And I pray, God, for every member of our church, everyone who is a part of this ministry, I pray, God, that you would give them courage to speak, give them the ability to defend their faith. I pray that you would give them the words to speak, Lord, when they do engage in conversations, Lord God. Give them, Lord, a loving heart in which to do it. But, Lord, give them a pit bull tenacity that they will refuse to conform or compromise their faith. And we ask you, Lord, to continue to strengthen not just our church, but your church globally. Wherever the, these pockets of gatherings might be, we pray, Father, that you would continue to do a tremendous work in these areas, in these lives, and in your people. And we thank you right now for those who are consistently coming to faith and joining the family of God. We celebrate them today, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said together, amen. amen.